So she's going to take a later date. And so everybody, this is Brenda Neese of Durham and can't wait to hear what you have to say. So, okay. Should we record? I, you said to remind you. Yes, I'm now recording. Thank you. Okay. Well, I, I just wanted to, I'm going to see if I can share the screen and make this work. Um, let's see. Okay. So I just wanted to thank um, Debbie Davis and all of you at the North Carolina Chill Society for having us here. And um, it's just, it's a thrill uh, to, to be back in, in North Carolina. I've been in North Carolina on and off for a long time. Um, never really active in the society. So I hope that will change. So um, I just, let me see if I can get the screen. There we go. Um, so tonight, I'm going to talk about the cello museum and you're going to get a chance to I'll tell you about myself since uh, Debbie asked and uh, but if I go on too long just you know give me the high sign and then we're going to hear from Erica and then we've got uh, a few other cello museum folks here we've got uh, Dr. Yuri Leonovich here and um, possibly Dr. Lori Libin um, and Renata Kwan. So we've got several uh, cello museum folks here I'd like to introduce um, a little later on. So um, first I'm going to start because Debbie asked, I'm, I'm going to tell you a bit about me. So my in interest in instruments began um, really early in life. My dad, uh, my, my mom's family had family reunions out in Arkansas. And we would go to the mountains to this Ozark Folk Center. And then dad fell in love with the dulcimer and decided he was going to start making instruments. So he always had a wood shop and I would always try to hang out with him and hammer nails into pieces of wood and other not so useful things, but I thought they were very entertaining. And uh, dad started going around Arkansas and Virginia and all he would drag all of us sometimes as a kid it felt like being dragged along and sometimes it was exciting and it got more and more exciting and we went and we met instrument makers and dad got supplies of wood and we went to their instrument shops and my first instrument that i actually started playing was the the dulcimer um and let me see if i can show you um so my dad made a number of instruments so this is a one of the instruments that he made so this is the first, um, not this exact one. There was another one uh, that was mine. It was the first instrument that I ever played. So it's a lap dulcimer. Um, and I enjoyed uh, hanging out in, in his shop and, and learning more about instrument making. Um, and then, um, you know, I started piano at age five. I just begged to play a musical instrument. And then um, I got introduced to the cello at nine and it was love at first sight. And so where kids had, you know, uh, pop concert posters all over, I would take cuttings from the local classical station magazine and I would make my own posters and my whole, my walls were filled with pictures of cellists and cellos and postcards, anything I could find cello related. And then, um, one of my first public gigs, I was 15 and I played at my piano teacher's wedding. And as a thank you, she gave me this book and this book really sealed the deal. That was it. I knew I was interested in playing the cello and studying cello history. So um, that, uh, that was just, you know, a, a revelation for me. So let me see if I can go back here. Um, then at age 16, I moved um, to Durham and uh, I started lessons. I, I went to the Duke String School and we lived just eight minutes from Duke. And um, I started lessons with Fred Ramey and um, Jacqueline Dupre always said that William Plath was uh, her cello daddy. Well, Fred Ramey always felt like my cello daddy and I had never had a consistent teacher up to that time, it was, you know, one year here, two years there, two years there. And then finally I got to Fred Ramey and I studied with him on and off um, from age 16 um, on into my thirties. So Fred was very important um, to me in my life. I was kind of hoping he might be, be here. Um, and then I played in the Durham Symphony for a while. I was the youngest uh, member at age 16 and Phil uh, helped me out once when I got into a bit of trouble. I think Phil is here tonight. Thank you, Phil. 
And um, I went to governor's school on the cello. And then um, I got, uh, I, I was very lucky and I won the Durham Symphony Young Artist Con um, Competition in 1987 and sold with the orchestra. And then I went to UNC and um, I studied uh, chamber music with Brent and that was fantastic. I remember our 8 a.m. quartets and um, I'm still friends with uh, Lisa from that group as well. So we reminisce about that, that uh, quartet. And I continued my studies with Fred as well. Um, and then I decided to, because I was so interested in cello history, I made my own major. So I did a, a major of interdisciplinary studies combining music history, art history, and archeology. span So that that way the music history is pretty obvious, but the art history, then I could study instruments in images um, in art, uh, in art history, that's called icon iconology. In art, in organology, which is the study of musical instruments, it's actually referred to as iconography. Whatever you call it, I studied cellos and pictures, and then I studied archaeology as well, so that I would learn how to examine instruments as artifacts. Um, and then at uh, at UNC, um, one of an uh, important book that I found was a series of books by um, Jeremy Montague. And it looks like a kid's book, maybe, you know, you think, oh, it's story time now. But this book is packed with information. It, um, it has so, it, when you open it, it is not a children's book, okay? So um, anyway, I, I also, um, I got to, I got a fellowship at UNC and I got to visit, um, uh, Washington DC and go to the Library of Congress and go to the Smithsonian and I played the survey strad. It was just set being set up for Anner Bilsma to do his recording of Bach. And so I got to play that. Um, and I went to Library of Congress and got to try a strad there. Um, and then I had a fellowship to go to London for a summer. And I visited auction houses and uh, I, I went to meet makers and I went to instrument collections and I measured cellos. Um, and I also, Fred uh, hooked me up with um, a wonderful teacher and um, this William Pleath. So I got to uh, study with Mr. Pleath and there's uh, there Mr. and Mrs. Pleath at the time when I was studying with, with them. And um, so I finished at UNC uh, with my honors thesis about the history of the development of the cello. And I did some, I worked with a physicist to do some statistical uh, scatter plots of the back links and so on of their development. And then I went on to do a master's in cello performance. And that's where I met Erica. I started at Florida State. And then I went to study with uh, Martha Gershevsky um, at Auburn and, but, when I was in London, Mr. Pleath had accepted me as a student, so I was desperate to get back with him. So I, um, I applied to Oxford and then I, I was accepted to study cello history because I wanted to go, um, Oxford is where Jeremy Montague was. So uh, I got to go back and resume my lessons with Mr. Pleath there, I actually had long hair. Um, and then I got to study with uh, Jeremy Montague, the writer of those, the, the book that I showed you. Um, and then when he retired, um, I, I studied with Hélène LaRue and uh, Dr. LaRue, this is one of her books, The Museums of Music. And she really encouraged me to study social as well as technical history of the cello. So not just measuring cellos, but actually, um, you know, looking at who played them and where and why and who didn't play them and, and things like that. And she had me attend uh, ethnomusicology seminars at the Pitt Rivers uh, Museum. And also, so I attended Jeremy Montague's musical instrument lectures and then Alain's lectures as well. Um, and then I went, uh, she helped me, she started this uh, project called the National Register and Database of Musical Instruments. And it was called the Horn, nicknamed the Hornblower Project. It's been, now been taken over by Google and I think it's Royal College in Edinburgh, but um, I did the pilot project of that and we mailed over 2000 collections in Great Britain and found uh, bass string instruments. And because people don't always know what they have. So we were just asking, do you have something that fits this description? We got a number of 
um, examples back. And so I had money to travel, but I didn't have a whole lot of money to travel. So I used my bicycle and I traveled and stayed in a tent. Um, so I had my notebooks and my camera and my bicycle and I'd be part of the time on the bike and part of the time on the trains and uh, traveled around Britain. And so during that time, I discovered what was then um, the, we thought it was the oldest found at, to date, oldest known British cello. And I found some unrestored cellos in original condition with their in buttons and short fingerboards and even um, early bridge or two. And uh, so that was, a, it was an exciting time. And, um, you know, I, I got to finish, uh, I got to do more studies with, with Mr. Pleath um, in some of the last years of his teaching. Um, and at this time I decided I needed a new cello. I had a, an old cello, which actually Erica helped me find and I loved it very, very much, um, but it just didn't have the big projection that I wanted. I was doing some solo work at the time um, and I needed to have the cello rise above the orchestra a little more than it was. So Mr. Pleath told me about some makers and then I found another maker and you'll see Mr. Pleath here trying a cello and then standing next to um, Dave, David Collins, who uh, turned to instrument making late in life, but he made amazing cellos. And so when Mr. Pleath tried this cello, he said, darling, darling, buy this cello. But un unfortunately that cello was already spoken for. So he, he said, then he said, if, if I couldn't buy that one, he said, commission one. So that was, um, I got to try a number of instruments and this is the hunk of wood. I got to pick the wood. He made uh, backs of maple and poplar and I chose a one piece poplar. I found that for me, I made a nicer sound on the poplar. Other cellists I heard made a nicer sound on, on maple is just very individual thing. So I chose this piece and um, let me just show you. I have this cello, I just happen to have it here. Um, and you can just about see um, it's one piece and it has a little wing, but it's all one piece of poplar on the back. So this is my um, modern cello that Mr. Pleath helped me, um, helped me pick out. And sorry, I don't wanna drop it. Okay, um, so let's, let's see here. It was an interesting thing I'd get on my bicycle and I would ride the nine miles down to Abingdon and check on the cello's progress. And I followed it all the way through until I went to pick it up, um, not on a bicycle because I couldn't bring it back on the bicycle. Um, then this was not my last time of looking at, at different cello. Oh, I have one other cello I wanted to show you. Um, I later went back because I studied Baroque cello at Florida State and I also studied Baroque cello a little bit at Oxford and I got to play on the J. Um, in fact, Jeremy used to call it, oh, that's Brenda's cello, the J cello. And so I wanted my own Baroque cello, but I, I couldn't afford an old instrument. So I had David Collins, uh, he made me this one. So um, this is a, a five stringer. So um, it's been slightly modified by John Pringle and it has my uh, initials on the back, um, which also are Barrett Norman's initials, but anyway. Um, so this is a, a, fun, a fun cello uh, to play. That one has the maple back. Um, he said that would be easier for the inlay. Okay. And that was not the last time I worked with a maker. So John Pringle, who is in Eflin, North Carolina, and he's known for um, making uh, violas de gamba. And he is an amazing, just, he can make anything. And everything he makes that I've ever heard sounds fantastic. Uh, so I worked with him and I wanted to try a little instrument. Um, it's, we, there's a whole story behind this and I won't go into it right now. And I had met John when I was at UNC, so I'd already known him and this, um, I had him do this in 2014. So I'm just gonna grab this cello so you can see it. It's a very small thing. Let me turn off the share screen so you can actually see it. Um, hold on. Okay, so you can see that this is a, not a very big cello. It, it is a cello, it's not a viola. You can see it's, it's fat. Um, you can see the end button he turned um, you can see the detail 
and I put a strap around it because I, I don't have as strong muscles, I think, as, as Branch does. And holding it without a strap is very difficult. Um, so although I need to practice it, somehow I can manage it on the bigger cello, but this one, it just doesn't, it's harder. You can see on the, on the front, he also did a nice little inlay for me. But my favorite feature is this uh, lion that he did. So um, anyway, um, that is another instrument that I've had made. So I've been, you know, obsessed with, with instruments for a long time. Let me go back to the share. Um, and so the adventure continued with that. And um, a few years back, I taking the little cello with me now, now I had a portable cello that will go on the bicycle more easily than the big cello, which I did manage. But, um, and this has my camping gear, my notebooks, cameras, <clears throat> and the baby cello strapped on. You can see where the helmet is. That's where I strapped the baby cello. Um, so, that uh, one one last instrument. Um, so this is uh, Dr. and Mrs. Yasunazaki. And um, why am I showing you this picture? Well, my parents during at college still had this idea that I should go into the sciences. So in a last ditch effort to make this happen, I got a job working with Dr. Friedovich at Duke in his lab. And then uh, Dr. Nozaki took me under his wing. Well, Dr. Nozaki is not, he was not only a wonderful uh, scientist, just amazing man. Um, he's also Emmanuel Axe's um, father-in-law. Um, uh, father and so he and Mrs. Nozaki would go to Tanglewood and he went uh, that year and he came back and he was so excited. He had a bunch of photographs and he showed me this really weird boxy looking cello and you with your, your mom playing it and so I thought oh my goodness I have to I have to have one so um that is the last cello I'm going to show you tonight and that is this practice cello which is a um you can see it's hollow so this is from the 80s it doesn't have a scroll and it fits into this bag so it's um, kind of a pain to set up and, and do, but I used to uh, practice it on UNC campus and um, I made the front page of the paper, I think once with the, um, the practicing the cello. Uh, and so that was, that was kind of fun. I try to practice between classes. Um, well, and that you are lucky because that is the end of my portion of about me. Um, so this, um, that brings us to, uh, I want to introduce my fellow uh, curator. She's a researcher and guest curator at the Cello Museum, which we'll talk about the Cello Museum soon. Um, and this is Erica Lessie. And some of you may already know her from her series that she writes for the Cello Museum called That's What She Says. That's What She Said, Postcards from Erica. And she writes about um, repertoire written by uh, women composers. So. Um, Erica, I'm going to mute myself and turn this over to you. And do you want the uh, slides on yet or off? Uh, in just a second. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna stop the share. You just tell me when you want it. Yeah, I will pull it up. Okay, okay. so let's see. I, um, just really briefly, I grew up in Massachusetts. Um, I started piano when I was five and cello when I was seven. and. I played violin probably for a few weeks or months. And then I think my parents realized that I was not destined to be a violinist. I just didn't like the squeaking under my ear. <laughs> and they ordered me a cello and then that was it. And the funny thing was, um, I think to get me to practice, my dad would play my cello. And I had not realized that he'd played a little guitar when he was younger. And so I thought, well, this is embarrassing. He seems really good without any practice. I guess I. I really should practice. And it wasn't until I was an adult that I realized that he played guitar. Um, kind of like Brenda, um, my, my parents were not musicians per se. Um, my dad loved music and um, he told my mom that he would love her more when she was 40 if she played the flute, which was hilarious. So she actually, she played piano as a, as a kid, but she took up the flute and, and she would practice and my brother and sister and I were practicing and it was crazy. And we had 
two cats and whenever she played the flute, one cat would bite her, one would crawl in the organ and the dog would howl. So I don't, the flute playing, I don't think went on for very long, but <laughs> my mom would help us practice. And we each played piano and a, and a string instrument because my dad loved music so much. So it wasn't that I chose music. My dad just told me I was going to play music. Um, and my dad decided that he wanted to take up um, keyboard, but for some reason it wasn't piano. He decided he wanted to play harpsichord. And in my household, we had, we started with the first keyboard um, was just an upright piano. And then I think next we got the, the harpsichord that was made from a kit. And then we might have gotten the organ and then the player piano and then a, um, the clavichord. <laughs> So we had keyboard illness going on in my house. And so each, each room had a different keyboard in it. And uh, my parents used to host dinner parties a lot because my dad was a microbiology professor. And so whenever people came over, they got subject to the, the um, my brother and sister and I playing trios. And then my dad would give these little lectures on the various keyboard instruments and show the difference between the clavichord and the harpsichord. And so I think that kind of rubbed off on me in some way, but it didn't occur to me for years that there could be more than one type of cello. I assume this was just true of keyboards. And when I was in high school and we were trying to get better instruments, my mom and I would go every Friday to the auction previews and um, you know bid on instruments and we'd get these violins. It was usually violins. I don't think we ever saw a cello. And then she would buy the violins and then have them restored and then sell them and gradually, you know, get the money to, to buy our finer instruments. So I saw all sorts of wacky instruments at the auction previews. So between, you know, having five keyboards in the house and having, um, you know, seeing all these instruments, I think I just got instruments on the brain. And I loved um, ethnomusicology. I think it took me a while to figure out what that was called. Um, I went to Indiana as an undergrad and studied with, with Fritz Mogg and I took jazz improv class there and I played a lot of new music and opera and things like that. And then I got to Florida State for grad school and I think that's when I discovered my love of ethnomusicology. It's got a really good ethnomusicology de uh, department. And um, so this, this friend is where you could pull up this picture. The first unusual cello I ever saw was a barrel cello. And this was, um, I think, late 80, I started my master's in 88. So this was probably 89, I'm guessing I saw this picture. And this was what was then, um, it was at the Shrine of Music Museum. So things were starting to get online, just barely. Um, the Shrine of Music Museum has now become the National Music Museum. But I saw this instrument and I was just fascinated with it. And so I started studying and seeing what other instruments I could find. And I, I don't know, I probably found, you know, I've never counted them up, probably at least 200 or something unusual cellos by now. Um, this was made by Palmer Rowe. He also made a stovepipe cello. And um, looking back in my notes, I actually went out to the museum in the summer of 2000. Uh, and I was allowed back in the in the back room and looked at the un unusual instruments, unusual cellos they didn't have on um, on display. And I there was something called a pitchfork cello, and I just paid no attention to it because it was just a pitchfork. It didn't have a body, and it had a slide. And I thought this was just, eh, I don't know, I was not interested in it. Um, and then you know, over the years, I've collected various unusual cellos, and a few years ago. I was sitting, as I usually do at the breakfast table, um, just looking up unusual cellos. And I came across this thing called a Norwegian lap cello. And I thought, I've got to figure out what this thing is. I'm fascinated. I don't know what a Norwegian lap cello is. I didn't know that there was only one of them in the world. So I, I acquired this Norwegian lap cello. It's like Brenda's little baby cello. It's very cute. Um, and it's made, the top is made from a, the neck of a three quarter size cello. And this is a cigar box. And then the, this portion here is a fruit bowl that intersects the cigar box. And what's interesting about it is to hold it together, let me see if I can show you this. That's the back view. So you can see there's this hump and it's very thick. This makes it very interesting to play this cello <laughs> because 
<laughs> you're getting the hands around the instrument is a little thick and then you get to you know to kind of mid position and um you can't really get your thumb around it so i'm learning how to play this thing it's it's very cute let's see i hope you can see that it goes in the lap um, so once you reach about here you've got to go into thumb position and you can see this this fingerboard is very short the cello has only got about an octave and a half range. It does have, it's tuned traditionally, the A, D, G, C. Um, it's, I wouldn't say it's a practice cello, but it's a softer cello. Um, and again, like, like uh, Brenda's baby, I can just throw this in the back of the cello and go play it in the park. It's a fun little instrument to have. Uh, the maker of this cello is Eric Oren. And he is from Minnesota, and he recently just started building guitars. He was an art teacher for years at a community college, um, but he'd always loved instruments. And, um, you know, when the pandemic came, he decided it was time to change careers. I'm going to show you another instrument he made. We may get a visit from my dog. Let's see. <laughs> there she goes. Um, this next one, I think I have to, I'm in a small room. I have to stand at the back of the room so you can see the full impact of this. This was also made by Eric Oren. I will show you details up, up close. This one doesn't have a name. It's made from a plow handle on the top and you can see it's got four strings. It's got a bridge and this is, this is one of those old violin cases. And then it's got a crutch foot on the bottom. And it's the height of a double bass, but it's tuned like, a cello. You can't hear that very well. Um, and it actually does feel like a cello on the hand. And what's what's hilarious to me about this is these strings are made from weed whack. <laughs> and so when you play them, they roll in the finger a bit. I'm going to take it to the back of the room so you can see the full height of this. I think this should about do it. Um, and I discovered when I stand with this, it does roll a bit, so I've got to attach a little dog leash to the side. It's got this nice little handle. And then I put that under my foot and it stabilizes it. Um, I prefer plucking this one just because uh, the wee wax strings are a little mean with the bow. I think it's got a much nicer kind of sound with, with this. But you can play Bach on it. I don't know if you guys can hear that. kind of an idea of that. Um, so what was kind of funny about this, um, further research led me to discover that Eric is the grand nephew of the man who started the Shrine to Music Museum, which is now known as the National Music Museum. And that's where I first saw the uh, barrel cello. So life has come full, full circle. I only got these two cellos maybe two years ago, I'm guessing. Um, and for the research uh, into the Norwegian lat cello led me to something called the um, pitchfork cello, sometimes known as the Viking cello. So Brenda, do you have, a, I think you have a picture of that. And this is really unusual because you can see this is not played in a traditional manner. The left hand, um, instead of being fingered, is played sideways with a slide. And I got a look at one of these. Uh, they've got some in historical societies in Wisconsin. Um, we believe that this was played with kind of the handle of a, of, of a knife. Um, and I, I actually got myself a pitchfork and I found a bird cage. And so I'm gonna have my husband make me this, this, this um, pitchfork cello. Um, and you know, it's gonna be interesting to learn this, this sideways um, kind of technique. Um, there were actually a number of people who played these uh, in the upper Midwest. These were played in the lumber camps. A lot of them did not survive because um, they were usually made 
out of cheese boxes, which were very thin. And so, and they were disposable. People didn't think of these as valuable instruments. So the one, most of the ones I have seen um, have, have, are in pretty bad shape because they, they weathered the, the lumber camps. Um, there was a maker in Chicago who was a violin maker who actually made several fine examples of this. And this is one of them. He um, also lived in Wisconsin. Uh, his last name was Reindahl. Uh, Newt Reindahl was his name. Uh, and so <laughs> they kind of referred to these as Viking cellos, the fine versions of the um, pitchfork cello or Viking cellos. But uh, this is from the Library of Congress, this picture. And I've come across, uh, you know, maybe 10 or 15 examples of these. So I don't think they were widely played, but all in the upper Midwest. And I think some of these people probably knew each other. There was uh, a traveling evangelist who played a, a bunch of instruments and he played this, um, this Viking cello also made by Ryan Dahl. He played a, a, obviously a different instrument, but had one made by, by him. And the interesting thing about these people is that they played a lot of different instruments. So they played these Viking cellos or pitchfork cellos. They played maybe banjo, they played guitar, steel guitar. So they, they had already learned how to slide with the instruments. And there was an offshoot of this uh, Viking cello called um, an alfalfa viola. <laughs> Now I decided to have my husband make me an alfalfa cello. And this was kind of the first experiment before we, we you know, we get to the um, Viking cello because this one actually does not have a body. And if you ask real cellist, this is probably not really a cello. This is the last instrument I will show you, but it's kind of a hoot. So what's interesting about this is this is the resonator. <laughs> Any, any kind of metal vehicle. Um, I'm gonna change chairs here really quickly. I have found it best to sit on a stool for this. And the idea behind this was to have, let me see if you can, hopefully you can see at least part of me, um, was to have a pitchfork up near the head and play it upside down. Now I decided I didn't want a pitchfork near my head. <laughs> it just seemed kind of dangerous. So I decided that I would in instead find a shovel. And I, I like this mud shovel. It's perforated, I found it rather attractive. <laughs> so what's really bizarre about this is um, that it has two external resonators, but you can see no resonator here. So you play it with the bow And as with the uh, pitchfork cello, there is a slide, but the slide is a box. So here I'm just, it's a one string cello. Here's the cello by itself. Not a whole lot of volume. Then you put it on the metal container, gets a little bit more volume. And then you use this box as a slide. You get a little bit more volume. So it's, it's, it's just kind of a funny instrument to me. I like it. <laughs> but I don't know that I would call it a cello. But, you know, obviously cellists could play this. And I'm surprised that, you know, you can actually find the notes um, playing with a box. And you have to use kind of the edge of it. This particular box had a hole it called the, the patent called for having a hole in the box and it actually makes it more resonant. So those are just um, some really quick, <laughs> unusual cellos. I have about 13 or 14 of them and not the, not the time to show all of them. So <laughs> there you go. All right, Erica, that, those are fantastic. So Erica, um, does presentations about these, she calls them her um, cellos of unusual shape after the uh, rodents of unusual size in the, in the uh, ride. But- uh, that, that was your, Brenda, you were the one who came up with it. Did I come up with it? Yes, you did. Okay, I thought yeah. you came up with that. Or maybe we were talking and you, I, you know, I, but, I was trying forever to figure out names of, for these things and we were talking and then maybe we mutually did, but you certainly helped it out. Okay, well, the COUSs. Um, yeah. 
So um, I wanted to go ahead and are you, um, shall I go ahead and introduce more members of our team? Yes, yes. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and jump back to this then. So um, when when I started, uh, I'll give you the whole story of the, the Cello Museum in, in a nutshell uh, very soon, but my dad taught me going along that if you make a team um, for something, what you want to do is get people who are as good as you are or better. And that way you will have the strongest team you possibly can. And I think you can see from Erica, you know, definitely we're very lucky to have Erica along here. And, um, but then we've also have uh, several other people. Um, Lori, are you here? I, I'm looking on the list of participants. Um, our um, senior advisor in organology. Lori, if you're here, if you can unmute. Um, let me see if I see him. There are some iPads and things. I don't know who they are. Um, anyway, so um, Lori uh, is just absolutely amazing advisor and, and helps us out with um, organology questions, cello questions, gives us great advice. Um, he said he might be here, he might not be here. Um, and then we have a, a, a newer member of our team, and that is um, Yuri. I think I saw you here. Are you able to talk in your point at this point in your evening? This is yes, uh, I can. Okay, let me um, focus on you now, and I'm gonna um, take the stop share. And let's see. Um, I don't have a camera right now. So. Oh, okay. Well, but, we can. But Back but I'll just speak if whatever you want me to say. Oh, well, um, I just wanted to introduce you as our um, uh, our cello music edition specialist. Um, Yuri has been extremely helpful in giving us all kinds of advice. And so um, he uh, does so many editions on his own. And I asked if he would, he would join our team. And so thank you for joining us, Yuri. Um, a pleasure. So um, is there anything that you would like to, um, to, to say to everyone or? Just that uh, th this has been a little bit of a push to make more additions uh, to be on this team and to uh, step up my research. Uh, actually, uh, I'm, I was just uh, ready for this meeting. I was uh, working on uh, the a survey daughter of the regiment of uh, a fantasy and uh, I have a really great advisor for that Peter Francois who is in Belgium he's the uh, president of the survey society and he just gives me lots of sources and I typeset them our project is uh, about 15 or text editions of survey works so I uh, anytime I look at the word survey, I, th I think of the first time I tried to say survey to a teacher, and I, th I think I said something like service, and she corrected me. So I, I just keep thinking back to that day, and I never knew that, or I didn't know that I would be working on Ortex editions of his works 20 years later. Well, it's so, so that, exciting. That's my current. It's exciting to see as you you turn out the different editions every week, you know. And I, um, if you want to find out which editions that that are coming out every week, you can join our weekly newsletter, and I list those every week, with links. So thank you. I for appreciate that. Here. Thank you so much for being here, Yuri. Um, uh, let's. Um, I also Yuri has. Um, well, let's see. I think. I see here as well, our newest member of our team, Renata Klon. Um, are you here? Did I am indeed, hello. Oh, hello, let me turn off the share and let's put you um, on, let's see. Oh, and I'm, I don't know how to unhighlight everybody, but um, how, all right, maybe somebody more adept at this than I can. Well, anyway, thank you for coming and thank you for, uh, if you see errors, it's something Renata hasn't gone over. So <laughs> <laughs> she's great. Um, thank you for being here. Do you want to to say? Um, just hello. Good evening. Uh, it's a it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, 
great to be to be part of the of the Turtle Museum family. Um, they're a wonderful group of people. Um, I'm a vocalist by training, not a cellist, uh, but my son is uh, a cello player now, um, and I've been a longtime cello enthusiast. Um, I was the vocalist with eight cellos uh, for the Bajianos Brasileiros uh, number five. Um, so ever since then, I've been looking for another set of eight cellists um, to, to sing with again. Um, and so, yeah, being, being part of the cello museum family is a, is a great experience. Well, we're so, so fortunate, um, to, to have you here. So thank you. And thanks for coming to, and, and to this, to this meeting. So, um, all right. Well, Brenda, you are muted. I know. I somehow got muted. I'm not sure how. Um, I'm going back to the share screen now. Um, all right. You would think after this many years of using Zoom, I would be a little more adept, but occasionally there are little blips. So um, we also currently have an intern. We have another intern joining soon, but we have Jonathan Simmons. Um, he uh, is currently st studying at Columbus State University, and he is just wonderful. Um, he couldn't be here tonight because poor thing he had, he has a borrowed Galliano and he's having to practice it tonight. So um, I uh, envy him uh, to, to get to play on the Galliano tonight. Um, but he helps us every week with the concert and event listings. And he recently wrote this great tribute to Elsa Hilger. So um, I just wanted to give him a shout out even though he couldn't be here. Um, and now I want to introduce the cello museum. Um, so the, the cello museum, um, after I, I was the first out of Oxford, I was hired as the first curator of the Duke University musical instrument collections. And uh, Jeremy Montague trained me up when I when I uh, got the job. And so I had a lot of curatorial training from from him. And he, every time I left, I, I stayed with Duke for just over 10 years. And then I left to go freelance. And um, every time I'd see Jeremy, he would say, so when are you getting a new museum job? And he was really after me. So I went to see him in October of 2019 and I knew the subject would come up. I kind of was stealing myself for this. And he, he said, yes, so museums. And um, then I said, Jeremy, if only there was a cello museum. And then it was like a light bulb went off. And that was a real aha moment for me. And that moment, that afternoon of the 29th of October in 2019, the Cello Museum was born. Um, Jeremy, I asked him formally if he would be our first um, senior advisor in organology and he accepted. And then uh, I met with Erica early in uh, 2020 in Chicago. And um, she said she was on board for it. And you saw her wonderful cellos and and you can see how we're both really obsessed with the different kinds of cellos. So she uh, signed on and um, sadly before, I think within almost within the hour of my announcing our opening on um, in September of um, when was it? I can't remember when I announced it, but we opened September the 18th, but within about an hour of my announcement, Jeremy Montague passed away. So he didn't get to um, see the, the museum um, come, come to shape, but he and I talked about it and what it should be and how it could um, serve cello, the cello community and people who are not cellists, who love the cello. So I wanted to talk about what the Cello Museum is. Um, the Cello Museum is really for everyone who loves the cello, cellist or non-cello. Um, and, and Jeremy and I discussed that using the online platform really allows the museum to be open to all and free of charge wherever there's an internet connection. And um, our mission is to present an interdisciplinary view of the cultural and technical history of the cello, as well as a perspective of its place in the world today in its many and widely varied contexts to cellists and all who love the cello. 
And this is also about making connections. The museum aims to foster connections among performers, teachers, researchers, composers, students, and audiences. Our vision is to inspire, educate, and entertain those who love and or play the cello. Um, and the, we ended up, um, we dedicated the museum to Jeremy Montague on his birthday um, last December. Um, and this is a, a digital, uh, this is a mixed media painting that, that we, we had done for him. Um, so the, the Cello Museum, when Jeremy and I and Erica and initially talked about this, um, uh, and, and actually I wanted to say before Jeremy passed away, um, he said we should talk to, to Lori Libin and ask him if he would also be an advisor. And that's how we were so fortunate to have um, Lori Libin on our team as well. Um, so before uh, the pandemic, we um, conceived the Cello Museum as having three things, uh, a weekly news roundup of cellos in the, cello stories in the news, and then uh, regular articles about cellos. And, um, and articles, while scholarly in research, still um, accessible to everyone, sort of like the History Channel version of cellos. Um, and then we also wanted to have exhibitions. So, um, and those are in the order of how fast they change. So news changes really fast, then we have articles, and then approximately every, one every six months, we, we aim to have an exhibition. So um, actually, um, but then the pandemic hit. And so um, our online museum then I decided we really should list online cello concerts and events. Well, and this is where I thought, oh my goodness, and Eric and I talked and we needed an intern to help us because there's just, it's so hard to keep up with everything. So Jonathan has been doing a great job with that. And every week we list the online um, concerts and events. Um, and I can say, if you want your event listed, just get in touch with us. And, but please give us not only links to how it can be watched or tickets can be purchased, but also give us time zones. And obviously most of you are North Carolina, so that's easy, but you would not believe how hard it is to find, even though now we're on a worldwide stage, um, the time zone for some, some concerts. Um, so just going back to our original three things, every week uh, we do a news roundup and you can find those on our news page. And um, every week we also have an article and the first week of every month we have, it's a curator's corner and that's where I do a roundup of what's going on that month as far as I can tell. Um, and it gives you a preview of what's going to happen. And then the third uh, week of every month, now we have Yuri's article about a cello piece. And then the last week of every month, we have the um, postcards from Erica uh, about the unaccompanied pieces by women composers. And then, we have every um, six months or so, our plan is to have a new exhibition. And our first exhibition is called Innovations in Cello Making Materials. It was just, this was actually supposed to cover also design, but we had too many cellos, so we had to split it up. So our, our, our upcoming one is also, is going to be on design. And there's a lot of overlap, but how we determined how to split them up was, was if, if these look more or less like cellos, you'd look at it and say, oh, that's a cello but it was made of something strange, like the one on the screen here is made of glass fiber. And it's a see-through cello. You can see the bass bar, you can see the sound post. It's a really interesting cello. Um, and then here are some more cellos. So we have metal cellos, we have glass cellos, we have ice cellos. And um, I think we have time to, uh, let me see if I can go and do a different share. So this may or may not go as fast as we want it to because sometimes on Zoom meetings, I find the internet connection is not great. But this is our exhibitions page on our website. So what you can do is um, you, can, you can find it just here um, in the dropdown. And um, this is a little bit about the exhibition and about what it is. And so we have metal, glass, ice, plastics, and fiber. And then for each one, because we we were, we conceive this as an online museum. It's not just for us. Oh yes, it is a website, but it's also a museum. So having worked as a museum curator for just over a decade, and then I've curated a couple of other shows, um, one at the North Carolina Museum of History and just at different places. So um, we wanted to make it so as if you walked in, you'd have the sort of 
here's the, the main image and the title, and then you get your information, your information panel, and then you get your different sections of the um, exhibition. And so um, you can see uh, the metal cellos, and then on each cello, this is, this is fun because you can then click on each cello, and this is where we may get a little bit of a lag, but we'll see if it can work. Um, okay, so it here is the, um, this cello and you can see different images of it and you can click on them and get the images bigger so you can see them different ones and then also as if it were on display um, if this we would have this on the wall next to it but the beauty of having it online is that this cello doesn't have to come out of its regular um, exhibit space um, if it's a cello that's regularly played this one is not but then it, we don't take it out of circulation. So the player doesn't have to give up the instrument. You know, we get some criticism of how, how dare you take these cellos out of people's hands. Well, okay, if they are in being played like this cello, then it can still stay with the player. Um, and then the beauty of it is that we can also have videos. So I will show you, I'm gonna scroll down. We have ice cellos here, all kinds of interesting things. Um, so let's go to this ice cello and um, so you can you can get the still images but then we can also embed video so you can then start to hear what the cellos sound like and you can watch him make part of a cello or you can hear a, a sound of it being played i won't do it now i don't know how good the sound will be over zoom but you can come in here and poke around and have a look so um we're hoping that this will be helpful for people who are looking for different kinds of cellos or just fascinated by different cellos, kids who want to do school projects, um, performers who want to try new things. Um, people can play these at ice festivals. I mean, when the world is open again and we can travel again, um, these are um, you know opportunities for performers. And we hope um, uh, interested listeners as well. So um, let me go back to the, um, let's see. And, and Brenda, I just wanted to add for everybody, if anybody knows of, you know, cellos um, that we are not exhibiting, please let us know. Or if you have um, some that, you know, there were maybe just one of in the world, <laughs> right? Oh, yeah. Um, let us know about those too, so we can post those. One of the, one of the great things has been having interaction with um, people that we've never met before who send emails and we get to find out about new instruments or new music. I think that's really nice. Oh yeah, um, it's that's it's one of the most exciting parts of um, of this work. And I have to say that a lot of these cellos, the bulk of these cellos, are from um, Erica's doctoral work that that she did. Um, a few of them I found in, in my my doctoral work. Um, but it's just so much fun, and we found some along the way too. I found uh, there are two more that need to go in here. Um, that uh, we haven't posted yet and we're working on the next exhibition now. So um, that's another nice thing about an online space is that we can keep adding to the exhibition as we have another one. We don't have to, oh, this, this the gallery has to be cleared now so we can put the new exhibition in. We can keep it up um, as long as we want. Um, another thing we've added recently is a cello book club, especially with the pandemic. Um, we thought it would be something we would try. Honestly, we we're only trying this for a year and we're gonna see if we like it. And so if you like the Cello Book Club, please let us know. Um, we have meetings once every other month. So our next one is in May and we are meeting with the author of the House of Music, Raising the Can of Masons. Um, she is going to join us on the 23rd of May at 7 p.m. British summertime. So um, please uh, sign up to come along for that. These are absolutely um, free meetings and um, everybody is welcome. Um, then let's see, uh, we also have a museum shop so you can get your cello goodies here. You can get a cello mug or a uh, cello net gator or uh, music bags. Um, we're adding to that and we have a designer creating some more art for us as well. Um, so I want to just uh, say, see, sh say how you could become a, a member of the Cello Museum family. Well, it's, it's not hard. Um, you can uh, sign up for our weekly newsletter um, and 
I am very careful not to email you more than once a week. And that just gives you a digest of the articles and things that have gone up that week and any news of things that, that are happening. And it gives you links to the weekly news roundup and the concert listing. Um, you can also join our book club, as I mentioned, and that's free and that has a separate mailing list. Um, you would get there are more irregular emails, uh, but so they're not weekly and they're book club centered. Uh, although I did email them about this meeting as well. Um, and then you can visit our museum shop and you can make a donation because right now we um, we operate entirely on volunteer work, donations and uh, proceeds from our museum shop. So every little bit helps. Um, and if you are into social media, you can follow us on Facebook. We just gained over 21,000 likes on Facebook um, just this uh, over Easter weekend. We have daily posts for uh, cellist and composers of cello music birthdays and then special days. We are also on Instagram, Twitter, and then on YouTube, we have lists of, we have the videos. I collect all the videos of the month for um, the cello birthdays, for cellist and composer birthdays. So you can look by month if you're looking for, oh, I want to feature a piece for my student or for I want to listen, They're, the lists are there. Um, and you can find out about all of this and more at cellomuseum.org. And I just, before we turn to q and I am going to, um, on your marks, get set, go. It is a race. So the first three to email me at curator at cellomuseum.org with your mailing address, I will send you a cello case sticker. Um, so if you want a sticker, email me and the first three emails to hit my inbox, I will send that out to you. And then also say, if you want to receive our um, email newsletter, you don't have to. If you want to, I'll add you to the list. If you don't want to, you don't have to. Um, and now it is time for uh, Q&A. So um, I'm going to stop the share. And if someone who's more adept at this than I am can, can make the whole grid of everybody featured, uh, that would be great. I don't know, Brenda, that we can get everybody in there, but I think if, if somebody speaks, they will light up. So I think everybody will be included. Okay, I, I have right now just uh, three people featured on my screen. Oh, damn. Did you, did you? Oh. Uh, Debbie? I'm accidentally muting her somehow, I'm sorry. Yes, Lisa? Uh, I think, there was frustration about the screen being not gallery view. Yeah, I'm trying to change it. Uh, hang on. Everybody can go to gallery view individually though. So, and Brenda, you are muted currently. Sorry. I'm, okay. Uh, remind there me we how, go. To, how to go back to gallery view. I don't remember. Um, you, you, and for me, it's in the upper right hand corner. You can go to speaker view or you can go to gallery view. Does that change everybody? It should change the recording. I think I've changed it for the recording now, hopefully. But I guess the recording's on your computer. Anyway, you would think I've been teaching on Zoom since 2012. <laughs> I should, they've changed a few things this past year, though. It's been interesting keeping up. So do we have questions or comments or cool cellos you want to tell us about that we should know about? Well, I just want to say uh, what you've done is just so impressive. and. It's not only impressive to me that you were uh, motivated to do this, but you've got the chops to really do it very, very well. I, I just think that's fantastic. Oh, well, thank you so much. Um, we've, we've just so excited. It's a dream come true, you know, as just sitting in that, um, sitting in Jeremy's sitting room and he said, you know, so are you going to get a museum job? And, and if only there were a cello museum. And I thought, oh, wait, we can make one and it'll be online and we don't have to take any cellos out of players' hands and it can be open 24 seven, it can be free and we don't have to pay insurance and shipping of cellos, which is a nightmare. And uh, so it just seemed like a win, win, win. We want the cello museum to be win, win, win for players 
for students, for people who love the cello, for um, you know, kids just finding out about the cello for the makers, you know, we, we give links to the living makers uh, websites and social media and things. Um, so we just want, we want to be a resource and we also love to hear from people to learn what you think would make us a better resource. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, it's amazing to, to see how hard Brenda has worked on this. Just unbelievable. This is, she's doing this all the time. This is her job now. <laughs> and she's not being paid yet. So it's amazing that she's, you know, doing this and, and giving so much time to this. And um, we talk at weird hours and while we're exercising <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> on speakerphone in the car. It's just, yeah, she's constantly working on this, so. Is there anything else of the sort that you know of? I know there are other cello websites like Cello Bello and so on, but. I, I think as far as I can tell, I mean, there are a lot of wonderful cello resources out there. Some are more geared towards players, which I think Cello Bello is aimed primarily at players. Um, I think some of the museum sites, they're geared for people who are not necessarily players and then it's not specifically cellos. You'll find a cello here and there. Um, there are cello blogs, again, usually aimed at, you know, how to and techniques and so on, which we have nothing against that. That's fantastic. But we, I saw an opening that for people who love the cello of all levels, this is not about competition. Um, we love the highest, most elite cellists. We love that. But we also love people who are just starting the cello and fascinated with the instrument, kids who are just, you know, I remember when I first saw a cello, when I first got to play one, it was like magic. And I want, if we can do that, we can't hand a kid a cello on the, on, online, but maybe we can inspire someone to go and try one. And, and that would be great. Oh, I, sorry, go ahead. Okay, Brenda, it's good to see you again. Jonathan, hey. Nice to see you. Um, this is absolutely amazing and fabulous work you're doing. Congratulations. And I know you're working very, very hard because every step of the way is time consuming and uh, requires expertise and luck and, and uh, grit. And so congratulations on this accomplishment. It's really amazing. I'm wondering if you're interested in bowed instruments that are held uh, vertically, if, if that generically would be considered a cello, because there are many in the world, as an ethnomusicologist, I'm speaking, there are many of these instruments in the world, I mean, uh, and fascinating instruments from all over the world that any cellist could pick up and play. I mean, that's the thing, because the techniques are all more or less the same. I remember playing the Mongolian horse fiddle when I was in Korea. And it's one long neck all the way down. And so you don't have to put your thumb out. And so you could just play all the way up and down. It's, it's, I mean, I'm just wondering if you're interested. The one instrument in the world that is an, actually a, a three string cello, and it is a cello, uh, is the Krong Kong from, uh, from Java. I don't know if you've encountered that. It's played without a bow, actually. It's a pizzicato instrument. And the genre that this instrument is played is called krong kong. It's named after the Javanese word for the cello. So I don't know, I'm just throwing that out. If that kind of information is of interest to you. It absolutely is, because I think that, you know, we have uh, Eric and I sit down and regularly brainstorm about future exhibitions. And I think that is, is the one that we've talked about or um, related cello related instruments from around the world that either influenced by the cello or are similar to the cello. And I think it would make a fascinating exhibition and I'd love to talk to you more about that. Um, at, you know, it, and we could maybe get our heads together and, and plan something. Great, that would be fun. Thank you. Yeah, well, thanks for bringing it up too. Especially if, if you have some of the instruments or if you have video footage and you've tried them. I have lots of video footage. I don't have the instruments, of course, because your house, as uh, our colleague Erica mentioned, your house can quickly get filled up with instruments, right? Whereas uh, the files are all digital. They don't take up much room. Yes, yes. And we have we have discussions about this. And, you know, had I, I, I did 
all the classwork for my doctorate and I started the thesis, but I never finished it. And actually my thesis would have been on what I termed variant cellos. Um, and the question is always, how do you distinguish what is a cello and is what, what is not a cello? I think whatever the cello museum calls a cello or a cello cousin would, 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 fit, would fit into that. And I think there could be two definitions. Uh, one is a, an instrument that evolved from the cello, like the bass arhu in North Korea. Um, uh, and then instruments that a cellist could pick up and play because the technique is sufficiently similar, like the Korean uh, 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 hagum or the arhu, or the kamancha from Persia. You know, they're all bowed, and they all have fingers on the left side and a bow on the right side. And, and uh, you know, there might be interest in all of those things. And I think Yuri was bringing up, uh, we were having a conversation about a three-string um, Ukrainian instrument as well, that I, 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 it's definitely a cello cousin. I like that term, cello cousin, you know, that's, yeah. a, that's a good one, so. <laughs> Have you had an exhibition yet of uh, cellos in art, in painting? Did you say that? I'm working on one. Um, and so I'm gathering, I had as part of my undergrad and then my doctorate, I have a sort of an, a file notebook that's about that fat um, full of actual printouts. This is kind of various phases of computer technology going back to the eighties. Um, so it's not, um, it's not ready yet. And we just opened um, on September the 18th, 2020. So we are just shy of seven months in existence right now. Um, so we've been working on it for just over a year before that, or just, I guess, you know, if we count October the 29th, 2019 as the, the, the moment that we, we came into being. Um, but the actual uh, first exhibition didn't open actually until October the uh, 16th or 18th, somewhere in there, mid-October we, we opened. So we haven't yet. It's, it's on our list and I'm, I've been gathering. So, but send me stuff, please. I, I love to hear from everyone and I love to get materials and I know you all see things. I can't see everything. I can't know everything. And, you know, I used to get students, they'd come to me, I've read everything, can you help me? And I'm like, I can't help you because I haven't read everything. So, um, you know, it's it's one of those, uh, that's why I love collaboration. People see different things and we can help each other. And and that's one of the things, the, the spirit of the, the Cello Museum. Well, and that's what's, what's such a treat with Brenda is to be able to call and say, Okay, we got another one on the list. What, do we do we call this a cello? Is this do we include this? Is this, you know, <laughs> because obviously Brenda leans more towards the the fine instruments, and I do have some fine instruments, but I also like these odd things that farmers or students create. I find them to have equal value, so it's really nice to to bounce them off somebody who's got a similar interest, but like a, a you know, slightly different bent, you know, and they have these conversations about what makes a cello and, you know, it, it's, it, there's no clear. Well, I, I mean, if we wanted to do horn, yeah, horn bustle sax, or we wanted to get into a, the nitty gritty of it, we could do library of Congress numbers and give us a cello number. But, you know, I find that it, sometimes, uh, a maker will call something a cello that wouldn't fit that definition that is played by a cello, that is called by a cellist, a cello. So we tend to have a different definition and it's not that we don't know the Hornbostel sax numbers. It's just that, you know, we, we take a wider view. Um, and I, you know, I think the Hornbostel sax are also coming under some, you know, scrutiny as well. But that's just what we, that, that, that's what I grew up with and I know it's, far from perfect, um, but it, it was, what I liked about it was a systematic number way of classifying instruments. So whatever problems it has, um, it, it, it's just a useful starting point. At least it was for me, for whatever flaws it has. But, you know, we go far beyond that. You can see with the ice cellos and so on. So, um, you know, they're percussion instrument. If you looked at it, it would be in a completely different family, but it, you know, it's an ice cello. Well, Brenda, I actually forgot to mention one instrument. I'll give you an example of how, how we deal with classification, right? Um, 
an instrument that's a Scandinavian instrument that led to the um, Viking cello or pitchfork cello is this thing called the Sal Salmodican. And you can see how it's got these teeth here. That's how you uh, find your pitch. And this is actually quite challenging for a cellist to learn. Um, I would play this standing up, but it's a one string. And they used these in the Scandinavian churches because in the early, I think it was 1819, um, some administrator in the Scandinavian churches decided it would be good to throw out half of the hymns that people knew. So all of a sudden people learned these hymns by ear and they had to learn all these new hymns and they, they couldn't find the pitch. And the churches didn't have the money for organs or pianos. So they devised these things called the Salmonican. As you can see, it's just a, a box and it's got one string on it. And what's interesting, it's, it's related to the dulcimer, but it's bowed like this. And then you find the pitch with your left hand. Now you would think being a cellist, this would be relatively easy, but because I'm bowing this way, as opposed to this way, it's really pretty tricky. Um, this is clearly called a Salmodican. They brought these to the Midwest and they stuck them on pitchforks. And all of a sudden, it's a pitchfork cello. Right? So an entirely different name. And it's just simply because they've stuck this on a stick that it, that it gains a new name. And it's a new instrument. But it's, it's fun seeing the different instruments and, and how they're used. Because I think you can look at, well, how they're built or how they produce sound. You can look at them from the point of view of physics. You can look at them from all kinds of um, perspectives. And, and so that's why when we're putting together our ex exhibitions, it, it's just, um, it's exciting to me to sometimes redefine um, the, the cello and what we're talking about as a cello. And, uh, you know, if you were to say, oh, show up with that to a symphony rehearsal, that would not go down well. But I mean, it, it so, there the definition would matter. And even, um, you know, if I were to show up with my baby cello to a symphony rehearsal, again, they would be, what is that? So, um, you know, I think uh, it, it's context and it's, um, there are a, a number of factors. Is the baby cello able to play at the same pitch or is it not uh, higher? It could, and we tried it at original pitch and it didn't sound good. So I um, made it, uh, I, I put it at viola pitch, but this is what really is weird. When I've gone to play with pianists, they say, wait, wait, hold on, wait, what octave are you playing? Cause it sounds like a cello because it has the fat ribs. So, and it has a really high arch. It's on a, on a Mahdi model. Um, and it's, there was this whole thing about making this cello. Um, and I picked out the model and, and uh, it's, it's, so it's, it's got really interesting sound. I mean, that, that would be for another, another day, another time. But um, so I couldn't get away with it in an orchestra. It just was too uh, uh, flabby a sound with the or original cello pitch. Oh, you're, you're muted, hold on. Yeah, I'm on your now, sorry. Okay. Even like my, my Lewis and Clark carbon fiber, I couldn't play that in a regular orchestra. It would overpower the other cellos, All right? And if I played it in a string quartet, it just takes everybody else out. It's just too loud and it's too different a quality of sound. It's, it's tuned like a regular cello, but it's, it's got a different quality. And, and that's an exciting thing when you look at the uh, fiber cellos in our first exhibition. Um, there is an, um, a wonderful maker, Tim Dwernick, uh, uh, Dwernick um, and he is in, from Belgium and he makes just fantastic instruments. And there are videos, he has a video comparing the sounds of a glass fiber, a carbon fiber and a flax fiber instrument. And it's very well done. So you can, you can hear the differences. And at some point I look forward to traveling to Belgium and meeting Tim in person um, and uh, trying his instruments. So uh, they're just, they're fantastic. And he's just a, recently won a, some awards for his instruments. Wow. 
Brenda and I secretly just want to have those cellos. <laughs> those are our favorites, I think, right? They're so awesome. We just, we just want, you know, music uh, cello makers to just donate cellos to us. Keep, <laughs> keep sending them around. I used to have this dream. Well, I, I still kind of do. But when I was younger, I had this thought that I would have this small barn and I would just have a rug in the middle and I'd have these cello-like instruments all the way around the room and I could just walk in there and just pick one of them up and play them. I, I still want that big room. <laughs> I feel I need to just focus on on just my modern and my Baroque instrument and the baby. And that that's already a handful. Plus then the cello museum work usually takes, uh, you know, way over 40 hour a week just doing the cello museum. Wow. So. And that's another thing I want to just put out that if you have college age students who need internship credit, um, we have occasionally, we have, um, Yuri has sent us a couple of wonderful folks and, and another one still. Um, and, but we, um, you know, we're going to have inter internship opportunities and it'll depend on your university program, whether um, a private organization can give can give credit, but I have in the past when I was um, at Duke, I was able to do internship credit for other institutions. We just had some paperwork to do, so we're very happy to do that, uh, so that students can, if they they're interested, you know, especially cellists who who want to get involved. It's it's always wonderful to work with with young students. And I would also say, Brenda, that if, you know, if there are people who want to contribute um, research or articles or information about composers, I would love if anybody wants to, you know, contribute some, um, you know, women composers of solo cello pieces, go. I've, I've actually discovered some great pieces this year where composers just contacted me and sent me their pieces and they, and they were amazing. So anything you want to, you know, share with us, any research, or if you want to, you know, write an article and send it to Brenda or I, I hope you're aware of Tim Holly's uh, Facebook page which is called the African American yep. uh, oh. he was here at the yep. beginning he said he had to leave to do something with oh, his okay but, uh, yeah I actually um one of the I contacted him a few years ago there was um a piece that I really like a broke cello suite that I included in, in uh, February's uh, that's what she said it when I did just African American composers, and um, Dorothy Red Moore uh, had a score um, that I've played for a number of years now, and um, Timothy Holly had, had performed that, so I included a video of him playing that. Yeah, yeah. he really has good knowledge of some pieces. Oh, he's a fantastic resource, and um, I mean, I would love to have a regular column from him, but I just we don't have a budget right now. So I can't really reach out to people and ask them to write because I can't pay. I mean, I'm not paid. I don't have anything to pay other people with. So I didn't want to insult anybody by just, you know, going directly and saying, hey, could you do this? But I mean, he's, he's on my list for once we're all paid, you know, and I can pay writers that that's going to, you know, definitely he's on my list to contact. And if I don't know if he'll be interested, but I, I think that would be definitely a, a, something we'd want on our site. Well, great, he's planning to watch the recording. So he'll okay. be glad to hear that. All right, hi. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and, and that's, you know, something Brenda and I have discussed a lot this year is that um, traditionally um, cello, you know, composers and makers have been predominantly white men, right? And we've really made an effort to try to be inclusive and, and include stories of people who do not fit that category. Um, and how, what, how we would like the cello world to look, not just how it does. <laughs> and I, I wanna jump in and also say that sometimes there's a problem with um, you know copyright for images that if we're having cellist birthdays, um, some of the younger cellists who are not all white men, obviously, um, but I can't get copyright to their images. So, and also it's sometimes hard finding um, younger cellists birthdays. So younger cellists, send me birthdays. Um, and, and also send me photos that I can use without getting sued. So um, traditionally, the, if you look beyond the 75 years, it, it, there are a lot of white male cellists. There's nothing wrong with that. 
<laughs> but that's, you know, I, I have had somebody did write to me and say, why are all of these birthday posts? Why are there so many? And, and it's a simple reason, one word, copyright. By the way, I see we had a question from Anna Dar, who's a very fine young fellow, <laughs> asking if you're interested in high school interns. Oh, absolutely. Drop me an email and we'll see um, what openings we've got and what you're interested in. Great. Wonderful. And also to have the perspective of, young, of younger people, because Brenda and I are both in our 50s, and we want to have perspectives of all age groups. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. The, the um, energy of young cellists and young students, that's just so wonderful. Um, it's a, a, very important, um, a, a very important part of the cello museum. So, I mean, I'm, I'm excited that we have, uh, you know, a, a lot of different ages represented. So um, I see, or I saw earlier uh, uh, Mensel here who sent us a, a, um, a cello picture. He was inspired by ice cellos and Lego cellos and he made a Lego um, ice cello. It was so detailed, it even had an ice scroll, it had an ice bow, he made the igloo performance space. Um, so it was, it was really, you know, we love hearing from students of all ages. So, um, and it, it's just, it's a wonderful energy to have. Well, and can you imagine if this inspires some people, young people to make instruments? That would be, yes. and invent some new cellos. That would be really great. Right, or to play a standard cello. I mean, it, it doesn't have to be a non-standard cello. I mean, I think it just inspiring a young person to get interested in, in music. You know, it's one of those things. I mean, even if someone says, oh gosh, there was this cello museum, but I'd prefer to play the viola. Okay, you know, it's a carry-on luggage, it's carry-on luggage. So, you know, go for it. But I, I like to, and you know, our focus is somebody said, what about a viola museum? And I said, well, you know, our focus is cellos, but we're, we're open to inspiring any, oh, and Mensel has his ice cello here. Can you, um, let's see, if you unmute so that you can say something and just show us your ice cello so that it'll be highlighted. Hang on. Oh. Um, okay, so. Wow. I just used Lego studs. I tried to find white and I made this cello. I have um, another cello, like one that I don't have anyone playing so far, but I actually got the idea on how to make the cello from the piano guys when they did the last Christmas with the Lego. So that's how I found the cello design. Very cool. Oh, that's and awesome. It's fantastic. It's so good. Thank you for sharing. I love the detail. I absolutely love the detail that you've shown. So um, Minsel is a is a very, very talented young cellist. So you hear more from him in the future. So all right. Maybe we need to create if Brenda a, a Lego cello set. Oh, that would be fun. I mean Wouldn't there were there are fun cello toys out there, um, but uh, yeah, that, that would be fun. Yeah. All right, any more questions do we have? Thank you, Ms. Holford, that was really great. That was so good. Well, on behalf of everyone, I wanna thank you tremendously, both of you, Brenda and Erica. It's been a fascinating time and I'm gonna make sure that I'm signed up for everything you've got at the cello museum. I hope everyone else will do the same. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for having us. It's just yes, been such a you. pleasure. And uh, it's that's the one thing I miss from not having a brick and mortar museum is that I don't get people coming by a desk and saying hi, or we don't have regular uh, presentations. I mean, the goal is later, Erica and I have talked about this, to have presentation of her, um, uh, her CUSs, her COUSs, and uh, um, some of my cellos and to, and to talk about uh, cello museum things um, after it's safe to do so. But for now we're online. So it's so nice to see you all, you know, virtually via Zoom, so. We've talked about doing like a cello museum tiny house and driving it around. And in the, in the house, it would be the stage 
Oh, right, and it would just lovely. open up and have the, the cellos in there and we could, you know, go on the road and just do presentations. Nice. Well, then I guess we'll say good night and um, look forward to all that you're going to be doing and collaborating with you, hopefully, in the future. Thank you. Yes. We look forward to it. Yes. Thank you. It was fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I hope to, to see you in, in a real space at some point. That would be absolutely wonderful. It would be wonderful. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you again. Bye-bye. You're welcome.